Hi, everybody. Um, this is Mary Beth from Operation Parent, and we're opening the doors for everyone to come on in. So um, as we go ahead and get started, I would love for you to go to our questions section in the uh, GoToWebinar panel. And the first box under the word question is like a kind of a bluish gray. If you could go ahead in there and just type in your name and where you're calling in from or watching our webinar from, um, we'd love to see where everybody's coming from as we could begin everything. Uh, I saw somebody said, I have lost sound. Um, Brittany, uh, best bet may be to go back in um, to log out, Brittany, and then come back in. Uh, I see Vanessa from Kansas, Cynthia from Ohio. <laughs> Kelly in the next room. Yeah, I saw that. Um, Michelle from North Carolina, David from South Carolina, Nora, Tennessee, uh, Sandy from Iowa. I see a Matthew from Montana. Hey, Waterville, Ohio. Uh, David from Kentucky. Great. I see Brittany came back. That's great. Um, Caleb from Idaho Falls, Idaho. I'm hoping we have somebody from North Dakota. That is the only state we have not had somebody come in from. Tiffany from Ohio. Uh, Stephanie, Florida. We got a Melanie from Pennsylvania. A lot of Toledo, Ohio people here. Jordan from Colorado. Kevin from Florida. I see somebody from Clary in Pennsylvania. Uh, we see Miranda from Indiana. This is great. Thank you, everybody. Just kind of keep logging in. I can't get to everybody but it's wonderful to see where everybody's coupling in from. I see somebody we have in here from uh, New Mexico. Great. It's great seeing all the different people coming in. Um, we're gonna go ahead and just um, continue to put in your name and where you're from, and uh, we'll begin the pro program in a, less than a minute. Again, my name is Mary Beth. I'm with Operation Parent. Um, we're just really glad to have you here today. We will be hosting webinars over the summer. So if you're wondering, we'll talk about our newest webinar coming up um, as we go ahead and get started. Uh, let's see. Great, this is wonderful guys, thank you. All right, okay. Well with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, let me get my slides going, everybody. Today, we're gonna to be talking about prescription opioid abuse amongst the teen population with Martin Red. He is with the DEA, and he'll be joining us in a little bit as we um, begin the presentation. I do wanna remind you of what is our next webinar. Um, this one will be on human trafficking, and it'll be on Tuesday, July 30th from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern Time. We have Amy Leonards. Um, she is the founder and director of Free to Hope. I just encourage you, go ahead, check out her website, um, and we'll have her website is freetohope.org um, to learn more, but she does really great work with helping people that are trying to um, make an impact on the human trafficking, but also for people that are trying to leave it. Maybe they've gotten into it and there is a way out. So she does a great job and we will be discussing how this affects teens, social media usage, and where the traffickers are finding our youth. Um, for those of you that are new to Operation Parent, we are a parent-driven organization. We provide education resources um, to those raising teens and preteens. We're really um, all about parents helping parents. We are parents here at Operation Parent, and our focus is to provide you the best information that's out there with additional resources, um, and just to kind of keep you the heads up on a lot of the things that are going on um, and how to help educate your children. So with that, I'm going to um, turn this over to Michelle Massey, my assistant, who is going to go ahead and talk to you a little bit about the GoToWebinar panel. Great, good job, Mary Beth, and thanks so much. This is Michelle Massey, as Mary Beth said, and I'm on the program development team here at Operation Parent. Um, I'm the proud parent of a middle schooler and now a high schooler, which is hard to say, uh, but the truth in our family, they're, they're growing up fast. Um, I just wanna take you through the system so you know how to use the technology that we're using today. Um, on your webinar control panel, you're gonna see an orange tab with an arrow. This tab allows you to open and minimize the screen. 
If you wish to view your screen without the control panel, just click on that orange tab and minimize it. For now though, please click on the orange arrow and open up your control panel and you'll view all the features with me. Many of you just utilize the question feature, so we know that that's working well. Um, and that's where we're gonna hear from you today. Um, you saw that the top panel there shows any questions that you've already posted. And below that is another light blue panel where you can type your questions and send them directly to us. So they come privately um, to Mary Beth and I. And so um, we're gonna encourage questions. We love questions and you can post them at any time during the webinar. We're gonna prompt you at the end of the webinar, but you do not have to wait until that point to go ahead and send Martin a question. All questions are gonna be answered at the end of the presentation. Just keep in mind that we might go over the 60 minute mark with the question and answer segment. So if you need to leave the webinar, um, please do so and understand that you'll get the recording with the remainder of the webinar. We've got some awesome handouts for you all today. We have a copy of today's PowerPoint, which is titled the prescription drug abuse among teens. We have a handout titled Growing Up Drug Free. Um, also some information on proper disposal of prescription medication, and then an excellent resource on prescription for disaster and how teens misuse. Just double click on those handouts to begin the download process. The handouts will only be available to you while we were in session. Once the webinar has ended and the session is closed, you will not be able to download from this location. However, just keep in mind, we just sent you an email um, also containing the handout. So you can download in either place, uh, but if you wanna be safe and do it while you're on the webinar, that's, that's a good course of action. We are recording this presentation and the recording will be sent to you tomorrow. Um, that's a question that we often get when we've gone off live webinar is when will we get the recording? So I just wanna reiterate that we, you will get the email tomorrow afternoon um, with the recording because a lot of folks want to re-listen to what they heard today and we certainly understand that and you will um, have an opportunity to do so. There will also be a short survey sent to you directly after the webinar. It will take about two minutes to complete and we would certainly appreciate the feedback because we're developing an amazing webinar program here and your feedback helps us to continue to do that. Now it is my distinct pleasure to turn it over to Martin Red, who's gonna take us through the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mary Beth. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Uh, before I start I, I, and introduce, introduce myself, I wanna make sure that I uh, send out a, a big thank you to Operation Parent. They uh, have such a, a great organization here. And I, I've known about Operation Parent for uh, quite a while, many years, uh, but this is about the first time that I've had to uh, actually work with them. And I, I do appreciate it. Uh, as uh, Mary Beth said, my name is Martin Red. I am the Diversion Program Manager for the United States Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA, uh, in the Louisville Field Division. And uh, what that means is uh, I am a program manager over all of the diversion investigators and diversion group supervisors that deal uh, in Kentucky, Tennessee and West Virginia. And what we do is we monitor and evaluate all of the legal pharmaceuticals that come in uh, and around the, uh, the three states, which is the Louisville Field Division. So to go into a little bit more of uh, what we're gonna do today, um, I wanted to talk to you about uh, some of the highlights, um, why the division started, uh, the best practices, the top programs that we have. There's a lot of initiatives that DEA gets involved with, and we'll go over those towards the end of the presentation. 
Um, first, I, I want to tell you, uh, and I know this doesn't um, really play into the people from Ohio and New Mexico and, and all over the, the country that, that's tuning in. Um, I did hear uh, David uh, from South Carolina. He's already got a special part uh, place in my heart, unless he's a Clemson Tiger fan and he not so much. Um, but I wanted to let you know, um, basically, uh, within the division, within the Louisville Field Division, uh, what we do is um, there's a lot of pharmacies uh, within the three states. We've got about 3,100 plus pharmacies that we deal with, uh, 47 over 47,000 practitioners, and uh, oddly enough, the treatment centers, which I, I think there should be a little bit more of, uh, within the three states, there's 48 treatment centers uh, in the states. Um, as you probably are aware, Louisville, uh, Kentucky, Charleston, uh, West Virginia, even Tennessee uh, are very, very high in the overdose death rates throughout the nation. And that's that's what I say is we've got a lot of initiatives that we're doing, but it's kind of a, a all hands issue to try to combat the opioid epidemic and where we are. So some of the learning objectives, uh, we've got three main learning objectives that we uh, want to go over today. Uh, the first one, gain a greater understanding of prescription drug diversion and the way teens are obtaining these drugs. Uh, we'll recognize the signs of prescription drug abuse and addiction and understand how DEA is addressing the problem. And I wanna go into that a little bit uh, more before we move on. Uh, first of all, we wanna we want to learn what diversion is uh, and how it impacts our society. Uh, the other thing is we wanna look at signs of addiction, but we wanna look at uh, how to combat these issues, whether you're a parent, or a teacher or a federal agency, uh, we, we, need to, we need to have some tools in our toolkit to be able to understand how to deal with what teens are doing uh, and, and what's going on in our communities. So looking at what prescription drug diversion is, uh, basically, it's a legitimate. It's legitimately made controlled substances uh, that are dr diverted from their lawful purpose into illicit traffic. That's what drug diversion is. Now, before we go forward, uh, let me let me give you some examples here. Legally, uh, what we do, we we monitor the legal uh, avenues of how controlled substance. Control, controlled substances get shifted uh, throughout the country. Uh, whether they are importing hydrocodone into the US, uh, that's an importation. If they're dispensing methadone at a narcotic treatment center, which is a methadone clinic, uh, a lot of people know these as, as different things. They're called narcotic treatment programs. Uh, if you're a dentist uh, that's administering controlled substances uh, in the office, a pharmacist who dispenses controlled substances through legitimate areas uh, such as uh, prescriptions. Those are all legal. Uh, now, if you get into the, the, the non-legal side uh, or as the, the federal regulations and laws read, not within the legitimate course of professional practice, uh, you start talking about uh, diversion as it relates to practitioner diversion, uh, where a practitioner may issue a illegitimate prescription for sex. That practitioner may have some type of addiction issue. Uh, if you're looking at uh, pharmacy thefts, usually uh, pharmacy techs will divert controlled substances. And we have known to investigate pharmacists as well. Uh, the medicine cabinets, and this is a huge deal with, with our teen population uh, and older population, is all the controlled substances that uh, we tend to 
not get rid of and leave it in the medicine cabinets. Uh, that's, that's a huge area for diversion. So those are some of the things that we're gonna talk about as we move through this. And I've got a couple of examples um, about cases that we've worked uh, in Wichita, Kansas, Louisville, Kentucky, Owensboro. So we'll go through those as well. So signs of practitioner diversion. If we, uh, if we look at this, practitioner diversion, and you could have patient uh, diversion or practitioner diversion. Uh, patients that travel a great distance to see a practitioner, that's a, that's a great telltale sign or a red flag, as we call it, uh, where the patients may be doctor shopping. Uh, these patients will also look for a relaxed uh, practitioner or a practitioner that may be near retirement that that's, doesn't have his guard up or her guard up as much anymore. Uh, not using all the tools to fight doctor shoppers. Uh, doctors, practitioners, they have uh, in almost every state, Missouri not, not, not yet, um, but a prescription monitoring program uh, that most states mandate these practitioners to look at to monitor their patients to make sure they're not doctor shopping or diverting pills uh, as they get them from the doctors. Uh, if a patient comes in and claims to have a textbook illness, uh, which requires a specific medication or that patient dictates to that practitioner that they need a certain drug or a certain strength of a certain, certain drug, that's usually a telltale sign or a red flag that that's a, a patient seeking certain medication. Uh, now, if you get into the practitioner, uh, who receives other forms of compensation for narcotic prescriptions. Like I said, some uh, want to have sex and they'll issue a prescription uh, and in return they get sex from the patient or drugs. They might write a prescription to a patient and tell the patient to go to a certain pharmacy, get the 90 pills filled and bring half back to me. That's a, a classic uh, addiction issue. Uh, or guns, anything, anything uh, for prescriptions that a practitioner can issue. And this is, again, for illegitimate purposes. This isn't for legitimate uh, medical illnesses. Ignore signs of abuse, uh, track marks on arms, not conducting uh, medical exams, a full medical exam. That's usually a uh, sign of practitioner diversion. So here in uh, Paducah, Kentucky, uh, some time ago, we uh, investigated a doctor, Dr. Troy Nelson, for, uh, and it, this, is, it, this isn't what uh, Dr. Nelson was charged with, but uh, one of the patients came forward and said that he was having sex uh, with a uh, specific group of patients. In return, he would issue the prescriptions to those patients. Uh, now, when we went in there uh, to do a investigation, we looked at the records uh, that he was supposed to keep, uh, and there were numerous record keeping issues, which he was indicted for and sentenced to one uh, year in jail and a $10,000 fine for record keeping violations. Also, when you look at fraudulent prescriptions, that's also a, um, a very uh, big issue of diversion. Some of the characteristics for prescription fraud or diversion of prescriptions is when a practitioner issues a legitimate prescription to a patient, that patient may seek to alter the pres prescription some way. Uh, alter the patient's address to where it won't come back on a prescription monitoring database. Uh, that patient may alter the quantity. Uh, a lot of times doctors will write the, the number 3030 for the quantity and a patient may put a one in, in front of the 30 to make it 130 pills instead of 30 pills. 
we always tell practitioners to get in the habit of if you're going to write 30, write the the letter 30 out. Uh, so you've got the number 30 and it written out, uh, whether in, in parentheses or, or next to the number. Uh, that, that always works well. A lot of times uh, we have seen where it's different colored ink. Uh, the doctor may be writing in blue ink. Well, when the patient gets at home, uh, the patient will pick up a black colored ink pen and alter the prescription. Uh, that should be a telltale sign for these pharmacists to understand, uh, to look at uh, all of this stuff a little bit better because they're, the pharmacist, and I don't know if we can tell who who's on there as a pharmacist, but the pharmacists are basically the last line of defense before those pills are issued and out into our communities. Another way that pills are diverted uh, are pill mills. Uh, they have really uh, slowed down a lot. Florida used to have a uh, unbelievable amount of pill mills and rogue pharmacies. Uh, new legislation in that area I know slowed it uh, considerably. But we had a uh, Dr. Steven Schneider who's still in prison. This was a 2010 conviction. It was about a four-year investigation. Uh, Dr. Schneider uh, saw up to about 100 patients a day, which any practitioners out there know that that's almost impossible. Sometimes he was seeing patients in his office uh, miraculously while he was at his vacation home in Mexico and would bill uh, insurance companies, Medicare and Medicaid, uh, for those visits that he never saw. So at the end of it, Dr. Schneider was sentenced to 30 years in prison. His wife, Linda Schneider, was convicted to 33 years, sentenced for 33 years um, because of her role. Uh, he actually went to trial. There were uh, 70 plus people that he was ultimately responsible for killing and he went to trial for 68 of the deaths and um, we, we got a conviction of that. Now, before we go forward, I, I just know that um, recently, uh, and this is a coincidence, in Wichita, Kansas, uh, there was a Stephen Henson, 57 years old, uh, who was a doctor, uh, like I said, in Wichita. He was convicted of excessive prescribing of oxycodone, hydrocodone, alprazolam, and methadone for cash. Uh, at least one death due to mixing the alprazolam and methadone together, and he was actually sentenced to life. So the prosecutors, uh, whether it be state or federal prosecutors, they're starting to learn these diversion cases a lot better. And where we were getting 10 or 20 years out of these, now there's enough to where they can seek life, uh, which is great if, if somebody's doing something wrong. Now, I also want to preface this by saying that we don't seek out uh, practitioners to investigate. Uh, if, if you took nationwide, there's probably less than 1% of the practitioner population that is under investigation. So we, we don't seek out um, these issues, they, they just usually fall in our lap because of some type of healthcare crime or, or over uh, deaths. Some other type of diversion uh, cases deals with pharmacy diversion. Again, uh, usually pharmacy techs are the, the culprits to stealing a lot of pills or shorting prescriptions and stealing the pills for their personal use. Uh, this came in uh, in Owensboro, Kentucky, where we investigated Mayfair Pharmacy. Uh, diversion does a lot of criminal work and a lot of civil work, but our main goal is to make sure that all of these DEA registrants, everybody that has a DEA registration, whether it be a practitioner or a methadone clinic or a pharmacy, they have to maintain records and inventories 
of what comes into their place and what goes out of their place. So if it's a pharmacy that we're talking about, those pharmacy uh, records will show kind of like a checkbook of all the pills that came in, all the pills that are dispensed and what's on hand. Uh, in this case with Mayf Mayfair Pharmacy, uh, there was a 140,000 plus hydrocodone pill uh, shortage uh, that we found out where the uh, pharmacy tech was actually diverting thousand count uh, quantities of pills and um, the pharmacist was actually diverting uh, Robitussin cough syrup with codeine. So the pharmacy paid $75,000 to settle the federal lawsuit. Um, unfortunately, both of the pharmacists that owned the pharmacy died in the investigation and were never criminally charged. Moving on to illegal internet pharmacies, and this is not the legal, this is illegal internet pharmacies. Uh, everybody should know not to use a website to purchase drugs unless the person obtained a valid prescription from a valid uh, licensed medical practitioner who has conducted an in-person medical evaluation. It's very important. The website is operating in accordance with the Ryan Hate Act, and we're going to go into that in just a second. Uh, but if you, uh, a lot of times uh, in the past, probably about five or ten or so years ago, maybe a little bit longer, it used to be where you could go on to an internet site or Google hydrocodone and hundreds, if not thousands of, of websites would come up. Uh, you didn't have to have a medical evaluation. You didn't have to have x-rays. A pharmacist sitting on his couch or her couch uh, somewhere in the nation would hit the enter button to fill your prescription and be paid every time that person hit the enter button. So illegal internet pharmacies, you really have to be careful uh, for. Uh, and these internet pharmacies introduced the Ryan Hate Act. And we're gonna go over that. Um, Ryan Haight was actually a 18 year old high school honors student, straight A's. Uh, he was an athlete. Uh, he died in 2001 from an overdose of Vicodin purchased from a rogue online, online pharmacy. Uh, to further that, his mother, uh, finding Ryan lifeless in his bed, uh, contacted the authorities, DEA got involved and found that he had overdosed on Vicodin, uh, which was ordered and prescribed from a doctor uh, that Ryan never saw. Uh, it was also delivered by a pharmacist that nobody knew. Uh, both are serving federal pr uh, prison time at this time. But that's what entered the Ryan Hate Act of 2008. This amended the Controlled Substance Act or the CSA, uh, the Controlled Substances Import and Export Act, uh, and added several new provisions to prevent the illegal distribution and dispensing of controlled substances by means of the internet. So as we go on, uh, we look at uh, more of, of what diversion is and, and it brings us to the medicine cabinets. Medicine cabinets are the number one source for prescription drugs that are abused. Uh, we've got some statistics to go along with that. Um, more than half of the teens, 73%. Now this is nation, these are nationwide statistics. These aren't uh, state by state, but nationwide, more than half the teens, 73%, indicate that it's easy to get prescription drugs from home. Uh, that's probably higher uh, because if you don't throw away the drugs in a safe and legal way, then they're just going to be sitting there in the medicine cabinet uh, for friends of the teens or teens to get to use illegally. Half of the parents, 55%, say anyone can access their medicine cabinet. And almost four in 10 teens, 38%, who have misused or abused a prescription drug, obtained it from home. 
it's awfully high. So when you look at the, the next set of statistics, pain reliever from friends or relatives, uh, it's a little staggering. Uh, you can read this, but uh, this st statistic shows more than 48% of persons 12 and older. Now, that's a little uh, hard for me to say because when we're talking about prescription drug abuse and addiction with prescriptions, legitimately made prescriptions, we're talking about 12 years and older kids uh, over 48% of these uh, kids and older got pills, uh, whether paid for or free, that's not the issue, uh, but they have the mindset that these pills are safer than the street drugs like cocaine, meth, marijuana, which marijuana is still federally illegal. Um, but 40%, over 40% got the pain reliever from a friend or relative, uh, probably from the medicine cabinet, and eight, almost 9% bought the pain reliever from a friend or relative. And again, whether it's free or they paid for it, they're still getting the drugs that we're not uh, safeguarding or getting rid of when we could. In a little bit, I'm gonna talk to you about the national uh, drug take back uh, and the, the numbers that we're collecting from across the board uh, all over the United States. But the bigger part of this, uh, moving on, is the misuse of prescription drugs is more prevalent than the use of cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, MDMA, and PCP combined. Very staggering to me. So I show you this. Um, picture of the University of Kentucky. I know if you're not in Kentucky, you could care less about the uh, the Wildcat Stadium. And David, I think you're going to, if you're still online, if you're still um, in the same line of thinking, I have a hard time being a South Carolina fan uh, showing this as well. But uh, I do this to show you the relevance uh, and the, the magnitude of all of these people, capacity of 61,000 people in a stadium this large, which brings us, brings us to the next statistic. In 2016, 63,632 drug overdose deaths. It's very staggering to me. So if you go back and look at all of those people in UK's stadium, uh, 61,000 capacity, the overdose rate in 2016 far surpassed that. You know, you're looking at one death every eight minutes, approximately 174 persons per day. Uh, 42,000 of those were due to uh, opioids. And if you compare that to our next statistic in 2017, it jumped from 63,000 total drug overdose deaths to 72,000 300. Now this equates to one death every seven minutes, approximately 198 per day. Uh, so if you if you really look at this, and of course that that number jumped from 42,000 in 2016 to 49,000 in 2017. So I'm going to leave it right here for a second, and and I want to kind of break this down a little bit further. I mean, we saw the validity of UK Stadium and it being 61,000 pills. We looked at how it surpassed in 2016 that capacity of that stadium uh, by about 2,500 people and even more in 2017. But if you look at with 63,000 plus deaths in 2016 and, and 72,000 plus deaths in 2017, I, I want to ask all of the attendees, are we socially accepting that pills are an okay way to die? Now I say this, knowing the answer, that it's not an okay way to die, okay? But I, I want to I want to put this a little bit more in perspective. Um, if I, if I asked 
this question. If 72,000 people in 2017 died from heart medication, I bet you they, the heart medication manufacturer would recall that drug and rectify that issue. Or if 72,000 people in 2017 died from a defective tire, would that tire company have a recall on that specific tire? So if you think about that, I hope that everybody listening uh, and all of the, the initiatives and outreach that we do and the educational awareness, I hope everybody takes a step back and realizes that seven, seven minutes, a death every seven minutes is not okay, or approximately 198 deaths per day is not okay. Uh, and I think that's probably why certain states are taking action to rectify or stop the opioid issue in their area, like Oklahoma, $270 million lawsuit settlement with Purdue Pharma, uh, the, ma the maker of OxyContin. Uh, and there's over 2,000 more similar lawsuits uh, that are doing just like Oklahoma did. So we look at why a little bit more in depth of why teens abuse prescription medication. Uh, and this is, if somebody could weigh in and tell us the exact answer, we'd probably a lot be a lot better off. Uh, operation parent could probably shut down their doors and DEA could go home and never fight the fight on opioids anymore. But um, as it stands, uh, we look at why teens abuse prescription medication, and there's so many different reasons. Uh, I think most of it is, is curiosity or uh, they want to get in. They, it's the trend. They want to do what their friends are doing. They want to get high. Uh, you know, many prescription drugs, marijuana and alcohol, um, alcohol and marijuana uh, used as a gateway drug that lead into other drugs, uh, you know, these prescription drugs can make you feel good. They make you feel better. Uh, people that are these teens that are depressed or having a hard time coping with bullying or any of the, the trends that are going on in the, the elementary, middle school and high schools now, uh, they think this is a way out. Uh, a lot of times this leads to overdose deaths. Uh, because they don't know how much to take. They don't know how much their tolerance level can stand. Uh, to uh, Another thing is to help concentrate doing schoolwork. Uh, ADHD medicine is a prime example of that. Or to perform better in sports. A lot of these high school kids that are trying to get uh, a ticket to college, they may uh, use controlled substances like steroids to make sure they get bigger and better and stronger than the next person that they're trying to beat out to get that high school scholarship or that uh, college scholarship. Curiosity is a big one. Uh, they just want to know how it makes them feel <coughs> uh, or just a, a try uh, a daring behavior. They just want to see what it does. There's so many different ways that uh, teens abuse these drugs. Like I said, uh, it starts with usually a, a gateway drug, which is marijuana, uh, sometimes marijuana and alcohol. Uh, these, uh, going back to the, the previous issue of um, why teens abuse the prescription medicine, uh, teens have done what's called a Skittles party or a rainbow party, and they will go uh, take prescription pills from the medicine cabinets, not knowing what it is and not targeting any type of certain medication. Uh, it could be a heart medication or it could be an Oxycontin from Purdue Pharma or it could be uh, a methadone pill for cancer patients, something. Uh, but what their initiation is to this party or this Skittles party is to bring a handful of pills, put it in a bowl with other pills, and obviously different colored pills, you have that Skittle effect or the rainbow effect. Um, and throughout the night, uh, as these high schoolers or, or even middle schoolers uh, will go to the bowl and, and pick up 
an unknown pill and take it. Uh, they don't know what the the level of strength is. They don't know what the pill is. They don't know if it's going to uh, contradict something in their body. Uh, so it's just a it's a very bad issue, and we need to make sure that we definitely rid the cabinets and the medicine um, cabinets of all unused or expired uh, prescription uh, medicine. So talking about student athletes, high school student athletes can be especially vulnerable uh, to prescription painkillers. And there's a lot of different reasons. And I and I said one of them, if a uh, person was in a high school sport and they want to get bigger and better and uh, stronger than the next person that they're in line with uh, for a college scholarship, maybe, they're probably going to uh, experiment with a controlled substance such as steroids. Uh, some other possible reasons for misuse is pain relief. If, um, if you're like me that it's overdone it uh, because I'm older and uh, I was out in the yard doing yard work because I'm not 20 years old anymore, they do it for pain relief. Uh, they, they don't want to be sidelined uh, and have this illness or, or this, uh, this illness that's going to make them not perform on the, the field. So they take it for pain relief. An eagerness to return uh, to the field after an in in injury or a belief that such med medication is safe because they're prescribed by a doctor. And that's what gets into these teens, uh, these middle schoolers' minds. They think they're safer to take a pill. It's safer than going out on the street corner and trying to buy marijuana because they hear that the marijuana is laced with cocaine. The marijuana is now laced with fentanyl, which is uh, a huge killer, um, and we'll go over the, the strengths of that in a minute. Uh, but they know that these pills, they, they come from a manufacturer, they're prescribed by a doctor who's very well educated, and they're in a pharmacy that's a sterile place, and they get these pills because a pharmacist thinks that it's okay to dispense a doctor's order for those pills. So commonly misused prescription drugs, uh, we'll go over those uh, opioids, depressants, stimulants. If you're talking about opioids, you're talking about uh, control substances like uh, Schedule II drugs like hydrocodone or Vicodin. Uh, you're talking about uh, Robitussin with codeine in it. That's a that's a misused, that's abused, not, not highly abused, but it's somewhat abused uh, and very low addictive uh, with the codeine cough syrup. Depressants uh, usually refer to as Valium or Xanax. Uh, that's usually a Schedule III drug, not as addictive and not as uh, abused as a Schedule II drug, but still addictive and abused. And stimulants, which is like Adderall or a Ritalin uh, type ADHD drug. So just to give you a feel of kind of what we're talking about with uh, hydrocodone, uh, what it looks like, you can see uh, in the uh, picture there to the right. Uh, usually uh, hydrocodone, it was a Schedule III drug, uh, DEA, a lot of other federal agencies, they saw the potential of abuse and the potential for addiction. So what they did is we lowered or either hired, whatever way you're, you're thinking of this, from a Schedule III drug to a Schedule II drug. It, it takes um, more to get this pill prescribed. There's higher security requirements, so people can't just break into a pharmacy and steal it off the shelf. Uh, this has to be locked up. Um, it's usually used as a pain relief, sometimes a cough suppressant if it's uh, liquid, uh, used in uh, something like Robitussin or a, a cough syrup like that. Uh, some of the overdose effects, uh, it's slow and shallow breathing, clammy skin, confusion, convulsions, coma, uh, and it could absolutely result in death, um, and we've seen it time and time again. The bendo benzodiazepines, uh, usually used as a sedative, a hypnotic um, muscle relaxant. Uh, 
sometimes it's, it's to treat anxiety. Uh, it used uh, some adverse effects as slurred speech, uh, nausea, vomiting, low blood, uh, low blood pressure, slowed breathing. Uh, it's starting to sound like a commercial, but there's a lot of effects uh, using these uh, benzodiazepines. Some slang names uh, that all the parents and teachers should be um, well versed in, and this is what uh, another thing that I'm going to talk about towards the end is know how your child or your uh, your student is talking. Uh, there's a lot of code names for things. You see these slang names for uh, these benzos or benzos and downers, nerve pills, tranks. Uh, you have to understand how these kids are talking to understand exactly what they're doing. So another is uh, amphetamines. ADHD uh, is, is one of these. It's taken to uh, produce a sense of exhilaration, enhance self-esteem. Um, a lot of kids are being uh, prescribed this by medical doctors. Uh, there's obviously some overdose effects um, when taken at large doses. Uh, they may cause dizziness, tremors, headache, flushed skin, uh, all kind of things, vomiting, some of the same things that uh, other controlled substance, and this is a controlled substance, will make you feel. Uh, it could lead to death. It could lead to overdose um, issues. And a lot of slang names, again, Benny's, Black Beauties, Crank, Ice, uh, there's there's a ton of different names. So when you look at all of these together, and a lot of doctors are shouldn't, but they are prescribing uh, what's known today is a Trinity cocktail. This Trinity cocktail uh, usually is a regimen which includes at least one of each, one of each of opioid, benzos, or a muscle relaxant. Uh, usually used in pill mills, you'll see this uh, many times in pill mills where a doctor that is prescribing outside the legitimate course of professional practice, that person will usually do this Trinity cocktail for everybody that comes into the office. They'll do the same strength, the same type of drug. Uh, they won't use like any other factors involved to treat each and every person that comes into the office. It's just a, a one drug, one strength for all type uh, rubber stamp. So when combined, it causes uh, respiratory, respiratory depression uh, most results uh, in severe overdose issues and death. So I know this is a, a little outside of what we're talking about with the prescription drug and uh, controlled substances. Uh, heroin is a controlled substance, but it's a Schedule One controlled substance, uh, and that's what uh, kind of is the bottom of the barrel uh, almost when people get in that circle of addiction they uh you know start out with some gateway drug they'll get into a, a hydrocodone or an oxycotton and then when they can't afford those pills anymore uh, they can get a much larger high at a a reduced rate get going into heroin So looking at fentanyl, and this is not the medical fentanyl that you get uh, when you're in the hospital or cancer uh, patients. This is fentanyl coming over from China. Uh, usually it's a synthetic opioid. It's 50 to 100 times more potent than heroin. You can see the pictures on the, uh, the right of the screen there. And carfentanyl, which is 100 times more powerful than fentanyl, and 10,000 times more powerful than morphine. Now what the picture is actually showing is the, the lethal doses uh, compared to a dime. So you can see carfentanil wouldn't even cover the, the ear uh, in that dime and the fentanyl usually would cover about the head in a, of a penny. 
So we look at signs of prescription drug addiction. Um, we've gone into a little bit about this, but if you look at the circle of addiction, it goes into talking about the marijuana and the alcohol, which I've already talked about is the, the gateway drug or something that, that gets the tolerance level started. Uh, once that tolerance level builds up to that marijuana or the, dr uh, the drinking, people want to have that, that first high again. So they move into like a Lortab or a Vicodin, some type of hydrocodone narcotic prescription. Uh, it, it takes a little bit, it takes less of the drug to get that same high. Once that uh, you you build that tolerance level to that hydrocodone, people go into an oxycodone or an oxycotton. Uh, now, granted that an oxycotton is eighty dollars per milligram, so not a lot of people, especially not a lot of uh, middle school and and high school kids, can uh, sustain a eighty dollar a milligram uh, pill because one 80 milligram pill is 80 bucks just about um, but what they'll do is after that they usually revert to heroin uh, or something illegal like that um, you can get it at probably ten dollars a bag uh, the high is a lot better uh, than the oxycotton or especially the the lower dose hydrocodone So we look at possible signs of prescription drug addiction. Um, I'm not going to read through all of these, uh, but you know, usually you'll see uh, problems at school, physical signs. Uh, they may change their their friends. They may jump from a a great group of kids to not so great group of kids that cut school. Um, they don't do their homework. Uh, they have money issues. There's drug paraphernalia in the uh, in the rooms. Uh, you as parents have to check these rooms and, and don't be a friend, be, be a parent and make sure that you uh, are aware of all of these signs, the school, you know, problems at school, the physical signs, bloodshot eyes, if they're dressing differently, that's all, that's all signs of uh, what we have to look at. So these are some of the uh, objects related to opioid abuse and we uh, kind of move into what we can do as uh, an agency or what you can do as parents or practitioners or pharmacists or, or people out there that that have controlled substance authority um, you want to make sure that we talk to your patients or talk to our teens, uh, our students, and we want to use the time such as dinner table discussions to uh, talk to um, kids, see what's going on at school. You know, what's what? What are the trends? Uh, don't make this such a taboo subject. Make sure that it's out in the open, uh, and then being informed. Uh, be proactive in the uh, issues. Use educational websites to understand the trends on social media and how kids speak uh, code uh, or with text or with photos. We all, we have to know this. So some of the um, DEA initiatives that I was talking about earlier, and I'm going to go through these um, a little quicker, but uh, everybody's got these handouts. Some of the DEA initiatives, uh, we look at enforcement activities where we deal with street drugs and drug traffickers. We uh, look at the uh, initiatives that diversion does with prescription opioids and medical professions. The community outreach, we do a lot of, uh, we touch a lot of people, we get a lot of awareness out with the educational awareness. Uh, as you can see with this next uh, slide, the statistic, uh, just in Kentucky, Tennessee, and West Virginia, we have had approximately 655 diversion outreach engagements reaching over 57,000 members of the public, which is uh, phenomenal. Uh, the Diversion Outreach Coordinator, Emily Cormier, does a wonderful job with uh, 
her proactiveness and, and getting us out there into these three states, as, as Operation Parent does, a uh, wonderful uh, organization. And then we move into the National Drug Take Back. Um, those of you that don't know this need to get on the DEA website and, and look at um, what we do, what DEA does as far as the take back. We make sure we um, partner up with the local law enforcement agencies that actually go out on Saturdays twice a year for about four hours and collect these um, unused expired prescription pills. And I can show you uh, some statistics and I, I think I can say that these are positive statistics of 17 national take back um, engagements that we've done. You can see uh, this last one we did with April 27th, 2019, whatever state you're in, um, obviously I'm, I'm in Kentucky right now. Uh, so, you know, the Kentucky, Tennessee, and West Virginia, you can look at those. Ohio, I know there was a lot of people from Ohio, South Carolina, you've got 11,000, almost 12,000 pounds of pills that were taking in. Now this was one day, this was April 27th for four hours uh, Texas, uh, anybody from Texas, you can see uh, the state collected 92,000 pounds of prescription drugs. Now, you, you ask, I, I get this question a lot, uh, how much of that uh, 92,000 pounds in Texas were actually controlled substances? We speculate anywhere from 12, 10 to 12%, um, but regardless, if you're cleaning out your medicine cabinet, whatever it is, it takes it out of the hands of these teens that could get it to sell or uh, take to school and um, abuse. So this next slide, we look at all 17 totals, uh, the 17 times that we have done a take back. Uh, you know, we're looking at over 11 million pounds, over five tons of pills. Um, Texas, you can see, uh, you know, after the 17 times, you weighed in at 912,000 uh, pounds. California, you're over a million, which is great. Again, within all this, this is 10 to 12 percent usually of um, controlled substances. Everything else is heart medication and vitamins or, or whatever is expired or unused. Uh, but I, I sure do appreciate everybody getting all of those uh, out of the medicine cabinet. And it's one of the, the greatest uh, initiatives I think that DEA does twice a year. So as we go through the, the next three slides, uh, I wanna highlight, uh, well, we're gonna highlight some of the additional websites uh, for education and awareness that everybody can log on to, get uh, a lot of materials, a lot of statistics, um, but while we're going through these, I, again, want to um, thank Operation Parent for the opportunity to be able to speak to so many attendees today. And with that said, that probably brings us to questions. All right, and um, thank you, Martin, so, so much. Um, if you have a question, now's the time to go ahead and type it in. Um, I just wanted to go um, real quick over these last few slides. In your slide handout, you have these slides. So again, if you've not um, downloaded these handouts in the live event, please look for an email from um, me, Mary Beth Uberti, at, or it's marybeth at operationparent.org, um, and you will see um, a handout, the handouts attached. But it's Get Smart About Drugs is one site to go to. And then um, we attach this handout, um, Prescription for Disaster. This is another handout you have. And then also the Growing Up Drug Free is another handout we um, attached. And uh, Martin and the DEA were kind enough to provide us with those handouts. So with that, again, please go ahead and post questions. I'm gonna go through the last few slides and then we'll hit all the questions. So um, again, just a reminder, the next um, webinar is on human trafficking. 
again on Tuesday, July 30th from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern Time. You can register right now at operationparent.org. If you do not see it on our homepage, which I don't think it's on the homepage as of yet, um, there is an icon up in the um, right-hand side of a calendar. Click on that and you will see it listed in our calendar of events. Um, I believe by tomorrow it should be on our homepage. Um, different ways to stay informed with Operation Parent is please follow us on Facebook, um, Instagram, and uh, Twitter. You can sign up for our e-newsletter. We, um, you just go to our homepage and you can do that right there on our homepage. Um, purchase a parent handbook. I'll show that in a few moments. You can do that also online. You can purchase our elementary or middle school handbooks. You can host a community presentation. I go out into the community and um, do presentations on anything in the social media world, uh, alcohol, marijuana, um, and then also on uh, helping your child cope with fears and worries, all different topics. You can find that on our website and just continue to attend our future webinars. For those of you that are interested, this is our pa these are our parent handbooks. We have a um, elementary version, talks about topics such as cyberbullying, coping skills, uh, friendships, um, again, it's available in English, Spanish, and Christian edition at $5.99 each. A middle and high school edition is more robust. It has over 40 topics, social media world, uh, drugs, alcohol, the uh, mental health issues, uh, legal issues, dating, dating violence, a variety of topics. It provides parents, uh, caregivers with information on trends, warning signs, uh, where do I go for more help? How would I know this is what's going on? So I encourage you to go to our website. If you want to order a large quantity, um, please um, just go into our website. You can put a query in and we'll get back to you. Okay, with that, I'm going to take a look here and see what we have in the way of questions. And hold on. Okay. I'm going to open this. Let me see here. Okay, here we go. It's a little bit easier for me to see. All right. Okay, what about Imodium? I M O D I U M. Are you familiar with that drug? I am familiar with it, but okay. uh, not a controlled substance. Not a controlled substance, okay. Um, do you see a day that doctors will not be able to write prescription drugs, uh, prescriptions? Um, going to the electronic version would defeat the counterfeiting of prescriptions. Well, I'll tell you, uh, DEA is really pushing the electronic prescriptions. Uh, it obviously will deter a lot of the, the fraudulent uh, writing in a, a one instead of just a 30 quantity. So now you got 130, uh, it'll deter all that. But um, we are pushing doctors to get more electronic. Now there's some that, that don't work off of computers. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're still gonna have the, the written yeah. prescriptions. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, <laughs> then I have, I'm curious, why did North Dakota have no participation in the 17th National Take Back Day? Um, you, you know, that's a good question. Um, I noticed that too. <laughs> yeah, and I think that was about the only time. Um, they've all, I think they've weighed in a, a little bit. Uh, but yeah, that one, uh, I, I don't know. Maybe, uh, the, the, the few, uh, law enforcement agencies that do participate, uh, maybe they just didn't that time. I, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. You know, it, it's we're we're getting more and more law enforcement activity uh, and participation. Uh, Prospect Kentucky has never done it in 16 times, and then this last time uh, they had something at Kroger. So, you know, okay. we're, we're recruiting more and more people every time we do this, and and the numbers keep going up. Uh, they increase every time we do it. Okay. Well, then here's a question I have for you: When it is not drug take back time those two times of the year, can people take, where do people get rid of the prescriptions? If they're cleaning it out after a death of a loved one and they have a bag. Um, I know I went through that with the death of my mom with cancer drugs and with painkillers she had. Where do they, where do you take them at that moment to yeah, get them disposed of? That great question. Um, 
I, and I can tell you that the two times that, that we aren't doing it in the four hours on a Saturday, a lot, I don't want to say most all, but a lot, uh, the, the vast majority of law enforcement uh, agencies now have what's called a, a drop box in their lobby. Uh, I know in Kentucky, mm -hmm. um, Jefferson County Sheriff's Office, uh, Louisville Metro, they all have drop boxes where you can walk into the lobby, drop the, the drugs, pill bottles and all, into the drop box and walk away. No questions asked. Okay. All right. Well, there you go, everybody. Just so you know, check with your um, police department for um, a drop box. And I see here, uh, I'm getting a lot of comments there. Hold on. I just lost my spot here. Uh, so what is the, wait a minute. What is the best thing a parent can do to help make sure their kid never starts using drugs? One more time. What is the, what is the best thing a parent can do to help make sure their kid never starts using drugs? Oh gosh, there's so <laughs> many little, yeah. you know, initial things that uh, parents can do. One is to make sure, like I said earlier, make sure to use downtime to educate your kids. I, I know I have had a daughter, or I have a daughter. I've had two daughters. <laughs> um, one, and I say that because she just recently left the house, so I'm, I'm an empty nester. Um, but I would talk to her, I don't even know, I, I don't wanna say every day. It seems like I infused it in her every day, but I told her stuff, oh, you know, hey, have you ever heard of this fentanyl? No, well, you know, let me tell you, even though you don't want to hear it, at mm. least you'll have the knowledge of it. Or if we went to have a Starbucks date, well, we would go and talk talk over just life, trends. Uh, she would usually be op more uh, open with me to say, hey, look, did you know this was going on in school? Of course, I'd follow that up by, well, don't ever do that because here's the repercussions. Mm -hmm. A lot of the teens, uh, kids, they don't know the repercussions of these drugs. Uh, so if you make them aware that there's a long term issues that could come out of this. Uh, so use the time wisely. Uh, be proactive and uh, interact with your kid and, and let them know the, the long term, short term effects, uh, what's going on, why, why they shouldn't take it. When I go into schools now, uh, the kids know about drugs and they know probably at least what I know about drugs. I tell them how it's going to affect them. They, they already know what it is and what they want to mm -hmm. take. I tell them how it's going to change or alter their life. So, I mean, I, I, I would say the, the, the outreach, the educational awareness of things that they don't know like football players, they don't know uh, the, the repercussions of steroids. They know what it's good for. Right. Uh, so I think that that initial awareness and being, um, you know, open with them is probably the first line of defense. Okay. And, I, I, and let me throw this in as well. I mean, if you have um, kids that you suspect uh, there's uh, some type of curiosity, search their room, look under the bed, look through their drawers. If it makes you feel more comfortable when they're not there, then do it behind their back. It's, it's your house. It's your room. Um, you, you have to keep them safe and that's part of it. Know, know the telephone number, passwords, all that stuff. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do to be proactive. It's something else to do, but I, what I do, which is not always easy, is please be awake when they come home, um, especially once they have their own cars and they're driving and you don't, you lose that time in the car together. You mm -hmm. kind of lose that extra time where you can talk to them or have a conversation and they don't have to look you in the face, which is what driving in a car is great for, but you lose that. So keep in mind when they go out for the evening, set a curfew. 
you know, a reasonable curfew based upon their age. And in some counties across the United States, there are curfews. There's mm -hmm. curfews for those 16 and under. Pay attention to the curfew, but be awake when they walk in that door. Don't let them, honestly, don't get into the habit where they're walking in and you're sound asleep. And because then you're missing that opportunity, you want to give them every opportunity to say no. And one of the opportunities to say no is I got a parent who's waiting up for me. Matter of fact, my parent will sit there and ask me, how was the party? And talk with me. And, you know, honestly, you're doing it just to make sure. And honestly, hug them, smell them. You know, Bill Alvler always jokes, right. pop them one, you know, have a big hug, get them to exhale, smell their breath. And if you're so inclined and so curious, drug test them. But that's the extreme. But my point is, give them other reasons to say no. Give them the reason of my parents going to be home when I wake up. I have a curfew. Can't, sorry, like to be able to party, can't do it. But also to help them set a goal for their future talk about what do they want because if they can see a future for themselves it gives them another reason to say no and that's what you're really working on also too beyond just the education which is so crucial but is to give them other reasons too um i just learned at a conference kids are overdosing and being hospitalized on imodium okay wow i that might be something to look up both of us yeah that would i mean that's something that we don't really follow um because if it's the same drug it's not a controlled substance so dea wouldn't get involved wow never heard of that before but i'll take a look too um let's see it says our police department has purple bo has permanent boxes that people can use during regular hours to drop off yeah clean out those drug um <clears throat> those medicine cabinets every place you have them uh, I can tell you in Kentucky alone, there's approximately 160 drop boxes in law enforcement, uh, you know, sheriff's office, police departments around the state. So I'm, okay. I, a lot of these uh, departments, they get grants. So with, you know, the two or three thousand dollars for the box isn't coming out of their budget, which is great. Yeah, yeah. Um, what about access to D-E-T-T-E-R-A, Detra bags? D-E-T-T, I don't know what that, E-R-A. Do you know what those? I, I've heard of it, but okay. I don't think we deal with that at all. What is it, do you know? I'm not sure. Okay, okay, all right. And why don't pharmacies have drug drop boxes? Well, um, some do. Uh, it is a great question. Some do. We uh, Not too long ago, several years back, we allowed the pharmacies, retail or chain pharmacies, to become what's called a collector. And that's a addition to their normal chain or retail pharmacy DEA registration. And they would be able to have a, a big box in their pharmacy to where people could do the same thing, go into the pharmacy, drop whatever they wanted to, pill wise into the the box and what that pharmacy would then have to do is inventory that bag when it's full and keep records keep inventories some pharmacies just don't want to get into that extra work mm. so that's why a lot of them don't uh, I want to say I queried this not too long ago and I want to say that oh gosh I don't want to throw a number out, but I, it was very, very low. Um, I, I want to say a, maybe a couple of hundred, maybe, across the nation that okay. actually had these collectors. Okay. Um, I have a comment in New Jersey. We have a few different websites that list drop boxes around the different counties. The box, the drop boxes are usually open during regular business hours as they are police departments. You have a few responding with the same thing, yeah. Uh, how do I get in touch with your office to implement a training for parents and church leaders in the context of Hispanic churches in Tennessee, if possible? Do you do trainings out in the community? We do, do a lot. A Hispanic? Hispanic um, we do not that's a good question we but we have okay okay um that was alexis um alexis our the contact information is on the um, handout so if you want to drop an email 
um, or you can drop one to me and I'll forward it on, uh, marybeth at operationparent.org, and where, I'll pass it on. Where is she located? Uh, it just says Tennessee. Oh, okay. Nowhere in Tennessee. So we would be able to accommodate it because um, we have Spanish speakers. Okay. Um, but not as far as assigned to outreach. Okay. So we, we would be able to do that. Okay, great. Uh, okay, I got an answer for the, I'm going to, I'm not pronouncing it, I'm sure, to Deterra, Deterra packets allow for in-home disposal of medications. They are like a Ziploc bag that have a carbon core. You can place the drugs in them and then add water, seal back up, throw in the trash. We're using them here in Idaho to keep drugs from getting into the wrong hands. Interesting. I there, had not heard of those before. There's a lot of stuff out there on the, um, you know, for people to buy, uh, a lot of pharmacies have the same stuff. It what it does is it makes the controlled substance um, inoperable. Okay. Uh, you can't pull the controlled substance back out of it. Uh, it's kind of like if you don't want to spend the money for that. Um, and, and again, there's there's all kind of different products, and we don't deal with mm -hmm. any of them. But if you wanted to dissolve your pills, if you've got 30 or 40 pills. Mm -hmm. uh, you can dissolve them in water, pour them into kitty litter uh, or coffee grounds, and then throw those in the trash. Okay. That's acceptable. Now, if you've got a couple of thousand, obviously. Right. Right. Wanna, a little bit more than that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you had just a, a personal right. medicine cabinet amount. Um, something else to keep in mind um, is to um, lock up your prescription drugs, you can go online and buy a medicine safe. You can buy them at drugstores, someplace to just lock them up. Um, just keep that in mind as a way to lock up anything that you have, even your um, Motrin and all that too. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, you can overdose on Motrin and it's quite it's quite harmful. So please um, keep that in mind. And that is the last of the questions. So I we've gotten through everything. And anything else you wanted to uh, add or something you thought of that you wanted to add at the last minute here? No, I, um, if, if anybody else has any of uh, any questions or comments, please, um, I think the, yeah, the contact info is on one of those first slides with my picture on it. Okay. And we'll, we'll get the, uh, the questions, the comments, and uh, most likely we'll get right back with you. Okay, um, one more comment. Can you comment on the DEA's success with the DEA 360 initiative? The success? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, DEA in um, Knoxville and Charleston, uh, West Virginia, uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, both are doing a phenomenal uh, amount of um, outreach. I, I don't have any statistics on how many people they talk to, but we... The, the one in um, our outreach coordinator in uh, Charleston, West Virginia, is very, very proactive. She does an outstanding job. Uh, she goes to all these schools, talks to them. Gr great, great um, job that she does. Okay. All right. Well, everybody, um, thank you so much for being here today. Again, as soon as I close this down, you will get a survey. It'll take about not even a minute to complete. I encourage you to do so. And please look for this recording in the follow-up follow email that you will receive 24 hours. So about 3.15 tomorrow, you'll receive the email with the recording in it. For those who are attending live today, only for those attending live, you will also receive your attendance certificate. That'll be attached. Um, it is in a PDF attachment. So just keep, a, keep an eye out for that. And with that, thank you so much, Martin and Michelle, for your help today and for Martin for your great job on the um, webinar and Emily. And uh, we're going to go ahead and close it out for today. Until the next time. Thank you.